R. W. Wood, continuing this genealogy from the Curies to Langevin, Wood studied with Langevin and then was at Princeton for a long time, and he also continued the work into high energy ultrasound, not the kind of ultrasound we use, but extremely high energy ultrasound, so high that if they were doing studies in the ocean and fish got in the way, it would kill them. So definitely very high energy. But So that led to some interest in bioeffects. We know from his studies that early sonar devices actually killed the fish in their beam path. Well, that's a biologic effect. But uh, now as we look at the medical applications, diagnostic, including Doppler, the physical therapy uses where actually you want to heat up the tissue, maybe even destroy small nerve fibers, that's very high power, high energy ultrasound. And then therapeutic ultrasound, which actually there's a reawakening of interest in, where you have several transducers that converge on a single point that you want to destroy, kind of like radiation therapy to get rid of some unwanted mass in the body. So the things to remember here is ultrasound is a form of energy, but it's not an ionizing radiation form. So we're putting energy into the body, but it doesn't have the same potential problems that X-ray can have in terms of genetic damage or, or cancer causing or whatever. Um, the output levels can vary a tremendous amount depending on what modality we're in, and we'll talk about that more specifically. For example, uh, I don't like to use Doppler in the first trimester of pregnancy at all because it's a higher level of energy, and if we're ever going to do any harm, it would be before organogenesis is complete at 10 to 12 weeks for most organs. Um, and th that's the point here is that the Doppler and M-mode uh, may actually have higher energy output levels. Now this <laughs> was an awakening to me. If I ever had any doubt about the fact that we're putting energy into the body, this is a breast cystic lesion, breast tissue here. This lesion here, you'll see we're going to put the calipers on it to measure it. And then just part of our routine anytime we find a breast mass is to put the color Doppler on to see if it has blood flow and what the characteristics of the flow. Is it low resistance, which might lead you in the direction? Well, we put the color, the power Do uh, the color Doppler here on, and you can actually see that stuff begins to stream in the direction of the beam. So clearly, you know, we're introducing energy that's energy enough to actually make this stuff move. So uh, that was a revelation to me. We won't continue the clip, but we get to what's called power Doppler, which uses even more power in a minute, and this stuff really takes off. So clearly, yes, we're putting energy into the body, and we need to be mindful of that. So what are we doing there? Well, there are two possible areas that we should think about. Thermal effects, because when we get to talking about attenuation, how the ultrasound gets used up before it gets to deep structures in the body, making things deeper, harder to see. Well, a lot of that is that that energy going in the form of ultrasound interacts with the tissue and gets converted to heat. Well, sometimes you don't want to heat things up, uh, early pregnancy again being a good ex example. So in the last several years, there's been a requirement from the FDA that all uh, diagnostic ultrasound equipment has to display a thermal index and a mechanical index. The thermal effects Sometimes you'll see it as TIS, which is thermal index in soft tissue, or TIB, thermal index in bone. Cavitation is the issue with the mechanical index. If there happens to be a little bubble somewhere in the body, the ultrasound interacts around that bubble and creates a lot of heat. It's a very small area, but it can be very high temperature. So we worry a little bit about that, too. So again, the thermal index is a ratio of the power used by your particular piece of equipment on that patient at that moment compared to the power that it would take to produce a temperature rise of one degree centigrade in that tissue. And so usually it's a small fraction of that, but it's kind of useful to have that information up there to remind you that, yes, indeed, we are putting energy in and we should account for it. And again, the mechanical index uh, basically looks at the possibilities that are non-thermal uh, in terms of bubble expansion or in terms of the thermal effect right at the periphery of, of a bubble. So here just a screenshot, and I don't think you can see it very well from here, but actually up here at the top we've got the thermal index and the mechanical index displayed. So that's right there for us to look at, and it's something that we should be aware of. So our protocols in general right now are we follow the ALERA, if you're familiar with that term, as low as reasonably achievable. We shouldn't use any more power than we need to get the information. Seems reasonable. And uh, limit the total exposure time, whoops, 
to uh, whatever you need, just enough to get the information you need. This is one area where I worry a little bit about the entertainment ultrasounds that are done where the families go in and they do the 3D pictures and they spend 20 minutes looking at the baby in the mall or whatever. That has a good side because it improves maternal and family bonding, which is a good thing. But if anybody is ever going to have trouble with exposure time, it's going to be from that kind of use. And again, my rule of thumb is, if all possible, don't use Doppler in the first trimester of pregnancy. The exception to that is if we think the baby has died, we may flip the Doppler on long enough just to see if there's cardiac motion and then flip it right off again.